morning again, everyone. You're very welcome to Shadow Christian Fellowship. I'm just going to pray for God's word before we begin. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask, Lord, please, that as we've just been singing about turning our eyes upon Jesus, Lord, we want to turn our eyes upon the word of God. Jesus is the word, but we want to look at the written word of God, that instruction that you have given to us, Lord, to help us, to build us up, to strengthen us and encourage us in our walk with you, even, Lord God, to lovingly rebuke us into right paths. Help us, Lord, today to hear what it is that your Spirit is saying to us, and give us the grace, Lord God, to apply your teaching in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're continuing in our Know Your Enemy series, and it's really important that Christians know, first and foremost, that you have an enemy, and then you need to know what your enemy does and how he seeks to attack you. So this series, Know Your Enemy, we're on, I think, about week 16 of it now. Well, God's Word says this. Even though we're doing this whole series on knowing your enemy and that the enemy comes against us, God's Word is absolutely clear. He tells us the enemy, the devil, is defeated. Jesus is victorious over him and the war has already been won. In light of that, we should just switch off the lights and last one out, lock the door. Because Jesus has it all done. If that was the case, if that's what that actually means. Now it is true, Jesus has the victory. Jesus has defeated our enemy. But most Christians, and this is sad, most Christians have no concept about a war that is taking place. It's actually happening. If God could open up our spiritual eyes and let us see now, there is battles taking place in the heavenlies. Your struggles that you face on this earth, first and foremost, something happens in the heavenlies before it affects you. That's why even our prayers are powerful weapons to influence what happens in the heavenlies. And the war in the heaven, the war in heaven began when way back the angel Lucifer when he allowed his heart to be filled with pride and he foolishly believed that he should reign instead of God. And so what he did was he persuaded one third of the angels to join in his re rebellion, basically to usurp God's authority. Well, God was having none of it and cast them out of heaven. And so Lucifer, who's also known as the devil, Satan, the enemy, and 29 other names that the Bible uses for the devil, he basically turned his attention on mankind. He knew that mankind was the highest of God's creation. He knew that God loved mankind so much that his way of getting back at God was to turn his attention on mankind and deceive them, causing them to disobey and to rebel against God. And as a result, all mankind, every human being born into this world is under the curse of sin that separates people from God and it leads to death and hell. This is the teaching of the Bible. This is not the words of Taddy Gordon. This is the teaching of the Bible. All mankind is under the curse of sin that separates them from God and leads to death and hell. But out of his love for mankind, God sent his son Jesus into the world to die for our sin, to destroy the work of the devil, to set people free and restore them into a right relationship with God, thus having all of their sins forgiven and giving them eternal life. So by his death and resurrection from the dead, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. So do you believe that the devil is a defeated foe? Okay, we believe this. However, the devil is a deceiver. Jesus himself called him the father of lies. He said, you are a liar from the beginning. You are the father of lies. The devil is a deceiver. And by deceit, even though he knows that he is a defeated enemy, by deceit, he keeps people enslaved in their minds. He keeps them uh, enslaved to sin, preventing them from knowing God. So let me just explain. If you are here today and you're not a Christian, the, the reality is the Bible says you are prevented from becoming a Christian. You are prevented from knowing the truth of the gospel, not by your own belief, but by the devil who is behind that. It is his job to prevent you from knowing the gospel. It is his job to prevent you from coming to know God, from believing the gospel, and from finding new life 
through faith in Jesus. So if you're watching in this morning, you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. The devil is behind it, but on the day of judgment, you're not going to be able to blame the devil. Because you've been told now, the devil's behind it, so what are you going to do? The devil does all of this. See all of the bad things in the world, even the good people who are still sinners, all that's going on in this world, the devil does all of this just to rob God of glory and to rob people of God's blessing. That's what it's all about. Satan's not remotely interested in you and the the, the, the day-to-day things of your life. What he's interested in is making sure that you never come to know God, that you never put your trust in Jesus, or for the Christian, that he will continually be working to deceive you, to rob you of God's blessings. That's what he does. And he does it simply to rob God of glory. And that's why battles continue to rage in the heavenlies, because while the war is won, the devil still opposes God and his saints, deceiving people with lies, keeping them captive in the strongholds in their minds. Remember, I was talking about the psychosis. Mental hospitals are full of people who suffer from psychosis. But a psychosis just simply means a wrong way of thinking. And when a person doesn't know God, it's because they have a wrong way of thinking about God. That wrong way could simply be, I don't believe in God. That is a wrong way of thinking. It is a psychosis that Satan has put into your mind. And that's why these battles are continuing, because Satan is always working to oppose God and save, deceiving people with lies, keeping them captive in the strongholds that he builds in their minds. But thank God, God has given people, his people, weapons to resist and oppose the devil. And we've looked at a number of these over the past number of weeks. The word of God, praise, prayer, worship, thanksgiving, and fellowship. These are just some of the weapons that every Christian in that sense has as arrows in their quiver to be able to use against the enemy. And for the next two weeks, it will be difficult, but for the next two weeks, I'm trying to combine two or three weapons per week which God has given to us. Because I'm trying to get this series, this series finished before 2025. Uh, <laughs> trying to get it finished before the end of November. The I don't know whether they're going to do it or not. But. So for the next two weeks, this week particularly, We're looking at three weapons that God has given, three more weapons. Now, I actually thought, you know, when I was working on this through, I said, listen, God, I think you've got your timing wrong here. No way way God can often get his time wrong. (laughs) Well, that's what we think, isn't it? Isn't that what we think? When we pray and we pray to God and say, Lord, do this, do this, do this, and he doesn't do it, so you say, God's got his timing wrong again. But God's timing is always perfect. But I was joking with the Lord during the week, and I said to him, Lord, surely I should be doing this talk next week. Because next week is the 31st of October and it's Halloween with all of its Fright Night glorification of evil and all that superstitious hogwash. Or should I say, Hogwarts. <laughs> School of witchcraft and wizardry. Do you know that I have never read any of J.K. Rowling's seven Harry Potter uh, fantasy novels? I've never read any of them. And nor have I watched any of the eight Harry Potter films or seen any of the five prequel uh, fantastic Beast spin-offs. I know nothing about them. But it's not because I'm scared of filming witchcraft or anything like that. I'm just not into that type of book or I'm not into that type of film. Give me a good horror movie. I watch Conjuring 3 during the week. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> or a splatter movie. I love stuff like that. But when you think of Harry Potter, apart from seeing this black clad occult version of the Milky Bar Kid. You know, do you think wizardry? Do you think magic and spell casting? Well, let me ask you, what is the essential weapon? What is the essential tool by which or that every wizard or witch must possess? Who said that? Somebody got who somebody got a red or a wand? Wand, you said as well, Patty, you should have straight out because Diane just stole your glory. <laughs> Diane said at first she just put her foot down on it. There'd be a scale pass on you. A magic wand or it is the tool or the weapon by which a wizard or a witch allegedly challenges their magic. It's supposed to be this really important thing. 
And I believe, let me make, make this clear before we get into this, I believe Christians should not, under any circumstances, endorse Halloween, wizardry, or witchcraft in any form. That's my view, because God in the Bible condemns it. And those who open themselves to evil influences or practices, they are more vulnerable to being deceived, duped, enticed, and seduced away from God by the devil's deceptions. Remember, he is always at work to deceive. In light of that, what would you think if I said to you this morning that the church collective, not shiny hopefully, the church is full of pseudo wannabe wizards and witches who abuse certain God-given spiritual <laughs> weapons, using and abusing them like they are their own personal magic wands? I wonder if you ever come across any of these so-called Christian Wizards and witches. I, I come across them all the time. They're winding up knowing it. And I'm sure they probably think he's worse than them all. But let's see what the Bible has to say. Reading from Philippians chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 1 through to 11. Paul already says this. Therefore, if there is any consolation, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which also which, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, pardon me, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue confess or should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Turn please to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to get a wee glimpse into the warfare that was taking place. Revelation chapter 12, reading from verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. The enemy knows he's defeated. In verse 1 to 4 of Philippians 2, Paul speaks here of the weapon of Christian fellowship, and we talked about that last week, how meeting together, Christians coming together to worship the Lord, coming together, being of one heart and one mind, and supporting one another in love. Billy mentioned it this morning, that it actually says in Psalm 133 that that type of unity, that type of fellowship, commands a blessing. It means that God can do nothing else but bless, and that was what we were trying to get across last week, that fellowship coming together like this is so important. It is a powerful weapon against the enemy. And then Paul speaks of Jesus who opened up the way for people to fellowship with God. And this Jesus, Paul says, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, 
Every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How come you never see any international football teams bowing their knee to this? They'll bow their knees to that nonsense of this Black Lives Matter. But they will not bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet it is clear, God has highly exalted Jesus and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ pardon me, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now imagine this morning if you're a person who lies to yourself and calls yourself an atheist. Because we know in Shiloh there's no such thing. An atheist is just another term for a liar. A person who believes their own lies. Because the Bible says that all that can be known about God is seen in all creation. And it says that he has set eternity in the hearts of people. Every person is born with a limited knowledge of God, but they choose to suppress that truth to believe their own lies. Now imagine if you're one of these people who call yourself an atheist. Here's what the Bible says. There is a day coming when you will have to bow the knee to Jesus and you will have to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says it's going to happen. Now God's word is true and God's word will be fulfilled. No matter how much you spend your life going through this life, denying the existence of God, believing the lies of the devil and believing your own lies that God doesn't exist or having a psychosis, a wrong view of God, there is a day fixed when you will stand before God in judgment and when Jesus is presented, you will bow the knee to Jesus and you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is it any wonder that the hymn writers and the songwriters that we sang write things like Jesus, the name high over all, in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall, and devils fear and fly. Or Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Saviour, glorious Lord. What a beautiful name, what a wonderful name, what a powerful name. It is the name of Jesus. God the Father has exalted Jesus to his right hand and has given him the name which is above all names. There is no other name. Please hear this today. And I don't care if all of the Muslims in Britain are watching this today. There is no other name in heaven, in earth, or in hell that is greater than Jesus. That means not Muhammad. Muhammad is not greater than Jesus. Krishna is not greater than Jesus. The Pope of Rome is not greater than Jesus. The Queen of England is not greater than Jesus. Any king, any queen, anyone on their world's richness is not greater than Jesus. Jesus is exalted above all. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord because no one is greater than Jesus. So the three weapons of warfare that I want to speak about um, are this, or these rather, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the testimony of the saints. Now, let me be absolutely clear. We're skimming the surface on these. All I'm trying to help you understand, Christian, is that these are powerful, powerful weapons when used correctly can do incredible, incredible things, not just in your life, but can do incredible things into the heavenlies that will affect other people's lives around you. And so these weapons, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the testimony of the saints, even though we're skimming the surface, I need you to think about what I'm saying this morning. These weapons have also been given by God to help Christians resist and oppose the devil. If you're the sort of Christian going through your life constantly like this in fear of the devil, then you're still a slave to the devil. He is keeping you through his lies and his deceit in some form of bondage or captivity. God has given up Christians powerful weapons to use against the wiles and the schemes of the devil. 
You know, if you read in the New Testament, certainly some of the Gospels, and in the book of Acts onwards, you will read numerous occasions when the disciples of Jesus spoke or invoked his name to give rise to miraculous healings, to resurrections from the dead, to deliverance from demons, and salvation of sinners by the preaching of the gospel. So go through it from, you know, more in the book of Acts, you'll see uh, a lot of these things happening, but even in the gospel when Jesus sent out the disciples, you read them, you will see that they, they called upon the name of the Lord, they uh, invoked that name to bring about incredible happenings. In people's lives and as the song says and we sing it here very very often there is power in the name of Jesus there is power I was listening to that song during we was trying to find one that we could sing which is more modern that you don't need an iron lung to sing uh, but I couldn't find one but there is power in the name of Jesus it's powerful the name of Jesus has the power to heal the name of Jesus could be spoken with faith and the dead could be raised. The name of Jesus is so powerful that we're told symbolically, like we took communion this morning, symbolically the wine and the, and the cracker that we took by faith are received as the literal blood and body of Jesus. Now, we're not into transubstantiation. We don't think that it literally becomes that. But by faith we are receiving him. By faith, Jesus becomes very, very real to us. The blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus is powerful. The blood of Jesus is powerful. It is able to set captives free. There are people here today who will stand up and testify how the name of Jesus set them free from addiction. How the name of Jesus set them free from some other slavery to some other sin. That the name of Jesus brought people back into a right relationship with God. That the name of Jesus... Uh, spoken into a person's life brought them back to spiritual life and into a right relationship with God. The name of Jesus is powerful. But also, if you look, look through the Bible, you will read time and time again about the blood of Jesus. And when we think about the blood of Jesus, we know that we, it cleanses us from all sin. And we can just read that life. You confess your sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what it's basically telling us, and Paul says it time and time again, is that the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from all sin. That means no matter how bad you think you are, no matter how wicked you might think you are, no matter how uh, depraved you might think you are, God is telling you that the blood of Jesus can cleanse you from all of your sins. That means that when God looks upon you, your sins are gone. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. <clears throat> the blood of Jesus can free someone from years upon years of guilt and shame. The blood of Jesus can sprinkle a person's heart clean from an evil conscience. I work with paramilitaries in the past who did terrible, terrible things during the Troubles and they will come to me and talk about the snakes in their head and the things that they did starting to torment them because of uh, crimes or whatever else. And I tell them that the blood of Jesus can cleanse you from all of that. The blood of Jesus can break the power of cancelled sin. The blood of Jesus can remove all of that guilt and all of that shame and all of that disgust. The blood of Jesus is powerful. It's wine, the wine, it's symbolic of Jesus' blood. It speaks of people bought, a bought people. Christian, you are purchased, you are a bought person, but the price paid was the blood of Jesus. Or, it's, or the Bible speaks of Jesus making peace for us through his blood. We've all read these verses, we all know these verses. And again, we've all sang, certainly here in Australia, there is wonder working power in the blood. There is wonder working power in the blood. And so we read in Revelation 12 verse 11, and they overcame him, talking about the devil, they overcame the devil, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. That's the blood of Jesus. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. 
See, Christian, we're going to get to the point here. These three, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the testimony of the saints, they are indeed powerful, powerful weapons in our warfare against the devil. But like all of the others that we've spoken about, they too must be used wisely and with understanding. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the testimony of the saints, they are not, as sadly too many Christians think, they are not Harry Potter type magic wands for Christians to play with or to abuse. Do you hear that this morning? The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the testimony of, of the saints, they are powerful weapons that need to be used wisely. They are not Harry Potter type magic wands for Christians to play with or to abuse. For example, shouting, in the name of Jesus! You ever see them on the godless channels? They wind me up in the wind. And I have the misfortune of flicking through the channels and you get onto one of them and it's usually the, some place in Africa and they're screaming out the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus and they're shouting all of this stuff. Shouting, praying loud, brandishing in the name of Jesus or I'm covered over with the blood of Jesus. Oh Jesus, will you cover us in your blood? Absolute cack. Complete and utter nonsense. And yet, many in the church run about with their wee wizardy witches' wands in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And they're saying all of this and doing this, and they may as well have a magic wand in their hand, thinking something's going to work. You cannot take the weapons of God and think that they are magic wands for your benefit. I know people who give their testimony. You're talking about the testimony of the saints. I know people who give their testimonies, and you've heard me say it many times. They give their testimonies and they talk about it as if they have done God a favor by allowing Him to save them. And that's how the testimony comes across. And you say, that's the testimony of the saints. And they overcame Him with the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. With the name of Jesus screaming aloud and shouting, and the testimony, oh God, you don't know how lovely you are that you've saved me. <laughs> Christians do it. Christians do it. And the problem is that when Christians treat the weapons that God gives us, like Harry Potter type magic wands, they become totally ineffective unless the user realizes the most important truth about every one of the weapons of God, particularly of these three. They're ineffective unless the user realizes that the power of the name of Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus, the power of the testimony that Jesus has given to you rests in the person of Jesus. Do you understand? There's a big difference between waving a magic wand and exalting Jesus. When you realize that each of these weapons, their power, and they are powerful, they rest in the person of Jesus. For example, just to give you a Dick and Dora version of it here. The name of Jesus, powerful, powerful weapon. The name of Jesus, who is that about? Who is the name of Jesus about? There's a clue there. There's a clue. Jesus. Jesus. Oh, only then glad you're back. Because you always answer the question. You don't always get the right. But you do answer. Thank you, Nolan. But you got that one right. The name of Jesus is about Jesus. And what is Jesus? Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. For he, Jesus, will save his people from their sins. Jesus is a saviour. It's about the person of Jesus. It is about the Savior, God become man to rescue those that are his. It is about Jesus, the Savior, without whom no one can be saved. The blood of Jesus, when you're talking about it the next time, the blood of Jesus, they don't cover me with the blood and all of that. I'm nonsense. The blood of Jesus is about the death 
of Jesus for us. The price that Jesus paid to redeem us. Do you understand, therefore, when people say, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood doesn't make any sense? Unless you understand the meaning behind it, unless you understand where the root cause of having this weapon at all lies, that it is in the person of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is about his death. It is about him coming and dying, paying the price with his blood so that we could be set free. The testimony of the saints is also about Jesus. The testimony of the, of the saints is about what great things Jesus has done for us. Not what great things you have done for Jesus. Not, oh God, aren't you lucky that you've saved me. The testimony of the saints is about what great things Jesus has done for us. So think about this, Christian. When you're going through a terrible time and the enemy's coming in like a flood against you and you think, oh, I'm not going to be able to survive this Christian walk and I can't live as a Christian as desperate and get it up. When that's happening, you actually start to declare a testimony. Oh, Jesus, you saved me. Why are you letting this happen to me? That's a testimony. You are declaring, you are proclaiming to the throne room of God, Lord, I believe in you. I have trusted in you. And therefore, I am yours. I don't understand why you're allowing this to happen to me, but it's happening nonetheless. And I'm looking to you to rescue me because I'm not going to be able to survive this. And that is the testimony of the saints. Satan can't beat that. When Satan comes against you, when all of the powers of hell come against you and you've got nothing else to offer except to say, oh, oh Jesus, Jesus, I've hoped in you, I've trusted in you, I've looked at you, you said you were going to do this, you said you were going to do that. That is the testimony of the saints. Not I used to be a drugs user. I used to sniff glue. That's a funny story, but for some people, uh, maybe you haven't heard. But you know, the reality is, it's about Jesus. Your testimony must exalt and magnify Jesus. <laughs> These three are not, <clears throat> pardon me, they are not Harry Potter like magic wands. I'm going to fly through this. They are not Harry Potter like magic wands that Christians can wield to impress others. I think, so. I know some people who think if they show Jesus loud enough, they think they'll make an impression. They think, as I said a few weeks ago, they think God's deaf. So they show, <clears throat> they show really loud. Or look, he'll cover me in the blood, Jesus. So Jesus so said, just don't walk into that stupid situation. That's more sense. These are not Harry Potter-like magic wands that Christians can wield to impress others or to add any semblance of authority to our wishes or our whims or to try to get God to act or to intervene for us. They are not magic wands for Christian witches and wizards to use in the church. These weapons are only truly effective when we realize that their power is in the person of Jesus. And so Christian, speaking, praying, or calling on the name of Jesus is only effective when we realize that the power lies in the person of Jesus, who he is, our Savior. Where he is, seated, exalted to the highest place, at God's right hand, what he has done, well, he has died to destroy the works of the devil, and what he continues to do, he's getting ready to come back to take us onto himself. Claiming or asking for the blood of Jesus to cover or to protect us is null and void. It is a nonsense if it's not understood that it means you rely, you absolutely rely on the finished work of the person. Of Jesus. Whatever testimony you have, Christian, it's just another life story. It's just another life story. Unless you realize that your testimony is about the person of Jesus and what great and marvelous things he has done for you and continues to do for you. You see, what I said at the start of this series, we weren't going to be getting in to give glory to the devil. It will be all about Jesus. Yeah. And every weapon that we speak of, and these three weapons today, they're all about Jesus, the exalted one. So Christian, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the testimony of the saints, they are not 
magic wands to be wielded by you to try to impress others or to add any semblance of authority to your wishes or whims or to try to get God to act or to intervene for you. But when you know their power is in the person of Jesus, who is exalted to the highest place, whose name is above all names, when you grasp this truth, when you make it a reality, then you will have in your arsenal three more very powerful weapons against the devil and his evil schemes. Christian, the series on the devil is called Know Your Enemy. And every Christian should. They should know their enemy. But equally, you should know your saviour and let him train your hands for war and teach you how to use these weapons effectively for his glory. And so my question to you, Christian, is this. Is Jesus training your hands for war? Maybe there's someone here this morning, someone watching it on Facebook or on YouTube, and you're not yet a Christian. Well, the Bible is absolutely clear, and I want to say this again as we bring this to a close. One day, you must, you must bow before Jesus and confess that he is Lord. That he is Lord. Now, you will not have any magic wand to make this disappear. This will happen. You will face Jesus either as your saviour or as your judge. And I would urge you, therefore, today to do as God says. Confess your sin. That means agree with God. When he says you are a sinner, agree with him. Lord, you're right, I am a sinner. Confess your sin. Repent. Turn around and turn away from your sin and your sinful living. And put your trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone to save you. Because every knee shall bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some will confess Jesus is Lord and will enter into his eternal kingdom. Others will confess Jesus is Lord and shall be cast forever from his presence into hell. Which shall it be for you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning we want to thank you for these three weapons that we've looked at. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the testimony of the saints. And we ask that you would give us the wisdom, Lord, please, to know how to use these weapons effectively to the glory of God. They are all about Jesus. They are all, Lord God, rendered ineffective if we don't get this right. But it must be about the person of Jesus. Will you please, Lord, train our hands for war? Will you continue to equip us against all of the wiles and the schemes of the devil? And will you lead us in your ways, Lord, as soldiers of Christ, rising up against the enemy, doing battle against the powers of hell, and gaining victory after victory to the glory of God our King. Lord Jesus, we need you to help us to do this. You have given us your Holy Spirit to empower us. May we, Lord, please live our lives for your glory. Will you help us, please, not to be duped, not to be seduced and deceived by the evil one, but to walk in your will and in your ways. Will you help us, please, Lord, to know what it is that you want us to do and equip us to do it and train, as I said, Lord, train our hands for war. We love you, Jesus. We don't want to be robbing you of glory by believing the lies of the devil. But we're asking you, please, lead us in your truth. Guide us according to your word. And may we, Lord God, see the power of the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the testimony that you have given us having powerful impacts in people's lives, all for your glory. We ask this, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen.